Welcome to the Animus podcast. Today we're going to be talking with Libby Davy. We're going to be exploring her work with social impact, her uh, compassionate coaching, the, the flow and emergence of the work that she does with her clients and organisations. We're also going to be talking about the connection that she brings to the coaching space as well as the wealth of experience that she has. Hey Libby, it's great, great to have you here with us today. Mm. Um, you do so many different things. I suppose it would be great if we could just kind of hear an overview of, of what it is that you do. Oh, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, I would say I'm primarily a coach. Um, my background is in stakeholder engagement and activism and many other things. I have worked literally um, cradle to grave with different projects and roles that I've been in. I guess um, coaching is, is a big part of my life. Um, I've also started to move more and more into governance. So these power structures we have in the world, you know, I think the more we can all show up and be powerful in whatever form to help shape, you know, institutions, you know, whether that's micro level at home or the institution of home, of family, or the institution of, of, of societies. I'm just kind of growing up bit by bit and just trying to play my part. Lovely. You, you said there that you know, you, you're a coach and yeah. coaching is what you do. Yeah. If I was to come along to, to have coaching with you, what, what might I experience? Well, what people say, because I'm really big on the feedback loop, you know, and, and really listening and being really open to what people say. So the thing I hear most often is um, I'm very warm hearted. So I really care about my clients. I really care about you know, the, the, the world, actually. Mm. But when we're in that space, I just, it's quite like meditation for me. I just feel a very open um, space for my clients' higher self to emerge. And whatever comes in, we, we just we hold and, and we work with that together. It's, it's very beautiful. It can be difficult, obviously, but my overall f f experience of it is it's a very beautiful process. You said there that you, that you really care and mm. I sometimes have conversations with coaches about sort of empathy and sympathy and mm. how sometimes our caring self can mm. create uh, almost like a, a blockage of the client finding their own sort of mm. power. Mm. I'm, I'm curious about how you mm. how mm. you manage that. Mm. Well I think you know, it's, coaching is a particular kind of field to be in. You know, there's mentoring, there's friendship. I also do facilitation and consultancy. But that coaching space, it's really about the client's emergence. And there is a resonance between us, which, which kind of activates the process. But it's not like I'm doing the love to the client. The client is love. I believe we are all love. We are born, you know, perfectly imperfect. And it's just the, the kind of the isness of that person that's, that's coming through. So I'm not doing it to the client. Obviously, we have methodologies and skills and we reflect back, we frame. Sometimes I feel like what I am is a storyteller. I feel like what I'm maybe trying to do is to help the client come up with the most compassionate, useful, effective uh, story for themselves and their world. That, that they can, yeah. That, that really resonates for me because uh, one of my big things is that whole narrative. What's that story that, oh, yeah. that we're running, that we're yeah. playing, that we're living out and yeah, exactly. how can we rewrite exactly. that story? So that was one of the reasons I chose Animus was because of your interest in narrative and mine. And I guess I'd been doing, I, I was studying Buddhism for 12 years now and I mean longer in different forms, but um, I kind of came up with this realization for, for me that many others echo which is that it, it's all a story. You know, I talk about the Libby story, you know, like every day I'm kind of, you know, creating this self. Um, so narrative really appeals to me. And it, and it feels like even just in mainstream business world, we're talking more and more about story. What's your story about yourself and, and other people that will shape how you show up? So it was a really good fit, yeah. Awesome, that's, that's, that's great. And you said there a bit about the, the sort of the resonance between you and your client, and I'm just curious, people sort of watching or listening to this, mm. how would you describe the creation of that resonance or, or what needs to happen mm. to, to evoke that? Well, 
I mean, I would say we need to communicate with whatever languages we have available. If we're meeting face to face, we're communicating in quite complex ways. So pheromones, for example, I often you know, joke about we've got to smell each other. <laughs> but then I'm also surprised at how effective Skype can be for coaching. So I guess what's happening is that we're really communicating with lots of different layers of, of language. Um, you know, from the, the physical, the visual, the, the, the verbal. But it's amazing when I travel the world, how I, I notice I don't even need to know the language. Here I am doing my Italian, I've just come back from coaching in Italy. I don't need to even know the language particularly well because if your intention is to connect, and it's possible because obviously it's not always possible. You know, I'm not suited to work with anybody in the world and they wouldn't necessarily want to work with me. But if I think if you kind of drop into... Um, just being present with each other, you can just kind of see, you know, if, if it's there or not. And then we can enhance that in so many ways. Maybe that's part of the, the, the skill of coaching is to try and enhance resonance, not just in the space with the client, but for the client, you know, throughout their life. Yeah, and that sort of speaks to me about the, the ripple effect of coaching. Yeah. So, yes, we're coaching a client that's in the space with us, but it has a ripple, it goes beyond just yeah. the us yeah. in that space. I get a bit excited, you know, and, and Nick had his expression for fractal coaching, and uh, I've got Roman broccoli at the top of my, um, <laughs> my Twitter page. So, yeah, I think it's really true that, that there is a, a lot of potency in, in the coaching world, and also in the therapy world. You know, they sit really interestingly, you know, together. Um, and I guess we both sort of help people come into their, their best self and to, to, to let what we could call, I don't know, blockage of, of energy or um, wounding, you know, perhaps to kind of fall away and just let someone come into their, their best story. And then that's going to connect with others. Now, I sound a bit Pollyanna and positive sometimes. <laughs> Let me just say, I'm very, very pragmatic. It comes down often to what is your next step? Yeah. What are your habits? Yeah. What are your behaviours? And we literally reprogram our brains by changing our behaviours. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It, I, it's interesting because you were saying there about... Um, uh, therapy and coaching and how they they can sit so well mm -hmm. together often when I meet new coaches or coaches in training uh, there, there can be a bit of a, a tension between these yeah. these two things how, how mm. do you manage well, that um, yeah in my um, assignment when I when I sort of you know graduated from Animas I wrote about how I, I was going to train as, as a transpersonal psychotherapist and I thought that was the proper thing right and I thought coaching was some kind of wanky American winners and losers <laughs> thing. And my gorgeous friend was going off to train at Animas, Charlie Kelly. And I was just like, oh, that's nice. I'm going to be training as a therapist. That's the real thing. And I've had such a massive shift. And actually now, if anything, I'm maybe a little bit too biased on the coaching front. And I'll, and I'll fall back into just seeing that they both have their natural place. And I think the main thing is no matter what our training or life experience that prepares us to be a coach or a therapist. I think we've got to know that we're safe and competent to be working with the type of person, with the type of material in the way that we're working. And if it doesn't feel right for either party, then we need to, be re we need to refer on. And I'd like to see therapists referring on to coaches mm. sometimes, just as coaches may need to refer on to therapists. That, that, so there's sort of what, part of what you're saying there is that as a, as a coach, to know your boundaries, to know your limits, mm. to know what you can and can't work with, mm -hmm. so you can go, okay, that's beyond me, mm. and seek uh, support, supervision, mm -hmm. help Absolutely. from somebody yeah, else. We're in a whole ecosystem. So I'm in a peer-to-peer -peer supervision group now. I'm about to go off and have supervision with, with Hetty Einzig, and uh, I, I'm, I'm in a whole web of relationships, primarily the one with myself that helps me just live spaciously and um, you know, reflect on what comes from sessions and then let go of what's not mine. But some stuff does stay because we're learning at the same time as our clients learning and that's the beauty of the resonance again, isn't it? We are changed by the process just as our clients are. Absolutely, I, you know, I notice when I'm working with my clients the, the things that I'm triggered to think about and to work on yeah. about myself from the conversations that I'm hearing or having with them yeah, in the space. Exactly. Like, interestingly, the first client I was offered, I turned down. I said, look, your material is, 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 is too much and too intense and I'm going to be too triggered by it. So I'm really sorry, but I'm not going to be able to work with you. And actually, it was very liberating to have a really clean no. That's, it's really funny because so many coaches, so many, interesting language lots of coaches mm. I hear struggle with that how do you say no mm. 
mm. to a client? How do you just accept that mm. we're not quite the mm. right fit? Mm. Especially when you're sort of new or young and fresh as a coach where mm. you just kind of want clients. Yeah, yeah. Well, I guess it's kind of trial and error to some degree, isn't it? And I think we've just got to be incredibly honest with ourselves and to be very careful about our sources of income. So when I was looking to train as a therapist, several friends who are you know, highly qualified therapists said to me, don't be paying off your mortgage. Don't rely on it as your only source of income. Because perhaps more so with therapy, you could get into quite long-term relationships with people that could end up being dependent. Yeah. So I think with coaching, it's quite different because we're only sort of, you know, I tend to be six sessions at a time and then, you know, other, other things after that. But I don't ever want to be desperate for a client. You know, if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. And I think it's really best to be able to say, if it feels right for both of us, let's go ahead. If not, there's no point because we won't get the results that we want. And how do you manage that sort of the, the income gain being yeah. a coach? So personally, I, I've, I've lived in all sorts of different situations financially, and I'm not in itself that interested in money. I'm interested in what money can do. I'm interested in money as energy, just like love and other forms of energy. So, you know, I'm, I'm about to Airbnb my house, you know, when we go away and make a tidy sum from that. I'm, I'm willing to, you know, get someone to clean and do the linen and whatever, because I'd prefer to do that than be desperate for clients, you yeah? So I think, you know, if you look carefully in your lifetime about, about money, how it comes, how it goes, if you learn to steward money well, so, you know, I've bought a house, you know, I'm, I'm careful. I don't want a lot, actually. Um, and I only spend money on what I really need to spend money on. So I guess everybody's circumstances are different. I'm in a marriage, so we can, you know, sort of work with each other in that way too. But I also have some clients that are very high paying. So I work on a sliding scale. Okay, so tell me a bit, bit more about that. Yeah, so, okay, so when, so my, my interest in coaching is primarily to work with compassionate individuals um, who want to make a positive change in the world, in their world, either very small or very large. So everything from parents and coaches to literally world leaders, uh, philanthropists, and those that are involved in corporate social responsibility. So you may have heard of the Sustainable Development Goals, which the UN has asked us to work towards by 2030 if we want to have life on the planet. Yeah, not a bad idea. <laughs> so in fact, the corporates are really signing up to the SDGs. And I have um, some very inspiring friends who are working in that area. So, you know, I might have said previously when I was 26 and a bit of a corporate refugee having burnt out from, you know, not living my values, um, that I didn't want to work with corporates, but actually that's not the case anymore. I want to work with compassionate individuals and organisations. So the SDGs is really interesting. In, to put it very bluntly, corporates can't sell stuff to dead people. So yeah. <laughs> climate change is such a big issue that we all need to face, no matter how difficult it is to face it, that um, the corporates are getting on board. Yeah, And so I would be more than happy to keep working in that space just as I'm more than happy to work with someone who's on benefits. And I really like the contrast. I don't want to be all, you know, one end or the other. So you're sort of working in that, that spectrum. Yeah. Um, I just put, there's a thought here around, I wonder how they sort of feed each other or help you feed your thinking about each other. Well, equanimity is this, is this idea that I, I think of it as twofold. Um, so in, in Buddhism, we, we talk about equanimity. So I want my feelings to, I don't want to be saying good, bad feeling, because if I say bad feeling, we push it down into shadow and project it onto somebody else, maybe. I want to be saying kind of, mm, that feeling's a bit like this, that feeling's a bit like that. So equanimity is to kind of balance feelings. It's also um, applied to people. Um, no one's good or bad or big or small or right or wrong or, you know, male, female, black, white. I don't really buy that stuff, you know. It's, there is something beyond that where we are all equal, right. This is just something I grew up with. I know it's a radical, dangerous thought, <laughs> but it's just the way I'm wired. So if I work with someone who, you know, looks micro because they've got low income and I work with someone who looks macro because they're in a corporate, you know, job and they can afford or they're a philanthropist that's another favorite area um, 
they're not better or worse. Nobody's better or worse. They're just different. And so mm. I absolutely love having that broad spectrum. So you, uh, you said there that you're sort of, you know, you're wired that way and that, that it may be sort of a, a dangerous way of being. And I'm wondering, being wired that way, what, what challenges have you had to face out there in the world as a coach, as yeah. it were? So, um, well, first of all, I had quite an unusual childhood. So my mum was in Jungian analysis when I was a kid. She was a very bright woman. Um, my dad was very, very earthy. And uh, it was kind of a bohemian child, quite mainstream in many ways, but also quite bohemian. And then I went to a, a Summerhill school, which is like a democratic school or a free school. Okay. So we were, we were taught that we're equal to the teachers. We helped run the school. We ran the canteen. You know, it was a very unusual setup. And then I had much more mainstream experiences. But that wiring, um, you know, made me a bit different, I guess. And so one of the challenges has been that I find it very hard to pretend to be normal. As, yeah. as a coach, I sort of go, what is, what is this word normal? What yeah, does that exactly. mean? Exactly, I know, okay. what is that word? But it's like, you know, when you go into institutions and we're socialized to behave, you know, I mean, yes, I can go in just about anywhere because I've had such broad experiences. But I guess it's something to do with knowing that it's all a story that we're making up this self all the time. I find it hard. I mean, I take things very seriously, as you know, but I also laugh a lot. And I find it hard sometimes. Like, we, we get so caught up in our stuff. Mm -hmm. And it is. Like, when you're in that moment with that client and they're telling you something really vulnerable, I'm, I'm, right, I'm certainly not laughing. It's not funny. But in day-to-day -day life, the things that we get so attached to our ideas about things, and, and I find it sometimes hard not to just laugh because it, it, it's all a joke. In fact, mum's dying words were, it's all a joke. Ah, okay. This kind of reality that we get so attached to and the tighter we hold the old reality, the harder it is for the new one to emerge. So the challenge is maybe that, I don't know, I walk along the street kind of singing and laughing and just being a bit odd sometimes, but you might have noticed it. <laughs> and at the same time, it is serious. So I guess it's like just being okay with, with paradox. That's, my, that's one of my favorite okay. things. Yeah, not right, wrong, black, white, this or that binary, but paradox is that and it's that. It's really serious and it's funny. And I guess when you're working or you're around those that don't see the paradox, that, that see it as this or that, yeah. not both or this well, and. and. More. You know, I mean, just being around the area here, I've walked through in London today and seeing the, the, the mosques and, you know, when people get so attached to their ideas and the fundamentalism, you know, whether it's about science or religion and the consequence of, you know, you think the consequence of us being that attached to our ideas and to think that mine is better than yours. Mm. It's scary, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, totally, totally. What happens, yeah. Yeah, and I suppose... I sort of go, how do you, I don't know if you do do this, but how do you distill all of those ideas into a, hi, I'm a coach and I might work with you well, conversation? Well, you know, again, it's not, about, it's not about me. So I'm just there to be, I, I think paradox is reality. You know, I mean, obviously, if you're doing brain surgery or something very, very practical, and sometimes we really have to choose, we're going that path or that path. But it's not necessarily right or wrong or black or white, it's mm. kind of everything's emerging in, a, in an experiment. And I guess we just, we just sit with the reality of that client's experience. Yeah. Yeah. And, and you, you, you're so passionate in what, in what you speak about there and um, your, your ideas and your, your sense of living, your values. Mm. And I'm curious about how does that show up in the, in, in the coaching? I suppose, you know, I'm making some assumptions about yeah. whether you might share some of that yeah, in your coaching yeah, or yeah. not, but I just kind of want to hear from well, you. I've really. lived a very diverse and interesting life. And I'm, I, another thing people say is I'm, I'm not very judgmental at all. I, I'm discerning, but I, I wouldn't say I'm judgmental. Like, I, it's pretty hard to shock me nowadays. You know, someone could bring in any material. I, I, I can't imagine what someone could bring in that I would you know, even feel particularly reactive to. I'd be, I'd be interested. Um, but I guess it's just, you know, when you're holding someone in compassion because you know you're meant to be working together. I don't, I don't offer to coach everybody. If I feel that there's something there and they feel that there's something there, we go into the process. And then whatever emerges for them 
is 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 what is 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 what needs to be there, do you know. So it's not my it's not about my values. I don't mm. kind of say, oh, well, I only work with people who are, you know. If someone is able in some way to self-identify as being a compassionate individual or organisation or wants to be, they may think they're the least compassionate person in the world. But if that sings to them in some way and they want to be more compassionate, then great, you know, let's work with, with what's there. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, yeah. it does, it does. I, I guess I'm also sort of interested in the the experience of being coached by you, but maybe that's something that we'll take well, offline and we'll we'll explore I that would, separately. I would be very happy to offer that, Robert. <laughs> yeah, because I just find it so... Um, you such an interesting and diverse uh, way of thinking. Yeah. That I'm sort of going as a as a client. I'm I'm just wondering what that would yeah. be like. What that would feel well, like. Well, it's pretty simple, really. I mean, it's just like you know, you're just there, and it's like, so what's going on for you? What's going on for you? And you know, all my stuff is 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 my stuff. That makes me who I am. But it's not really about who I am. It's mm. about who you are. Absolutely. It's about what's Absolutely. happening in your life that wants to emerge. I mean, I. I I wouldn't ever compare myself to someone like the Dalai Lama because he's a, he's, a, he's a monk, he's a man, he's Tibetan. But I kind of guess, and what I've experienced being around him is that, you know, he's not kind of telling me how to be. He's just doing, he's just doing him and, you know, and I've done me. Um, it's like the podcast I started, The Bee and the Flower. Okay. Um, the, the bee doesn't give to the flower, the flower doesn't give to the bee. The bee's not kind of thinking, what kind of a bee am I? And the, you know, they're just like... They're just doing what they do and they pollinate. And I think that's what happens in coaching. It's not about me doing me for you, you doing you for me. It's just what, it just happens, it's quite magical actually. I, I totally agree that yeah. th th there's uh, an emergence that takes place yeah. in coaching. As yeah. When you're in that space, something comes out of it and it's about the two people that are in it. It's about yeah. how that space is held and it's yeah. about the intentions yeah. uh, and things come into it and often not what we thought we were going to bring, something very different comes in, something yeah. that's perhaps uh, more present to our attention or needing to yeah. needing us to focus on in that, yeah. that moment that yeah. kind of comes there. It doesn't have to be complex. It can just be to just give attention to... Something and, and I love that old saying, you only have to be better than a lamppost. <laughs> Hopefully we're a little bit better than that. But I mean, just to give someone space to, you know, and to reflect back. And one thing that people say is that I'm very incisive. So I'll, I can deal with quite a lot of complexity. They can tell me their story and then I'll hear it and reflect it back. And I'll go like, oh, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, like that. But I, but maybe I've kind of massaged it on the way through to mm. help them see the possibility of it rather than get stuck in the negative scripting from the past. So that that ability to hear that whole that whole story and to to hold it is that is that something that you've you've grown and developed, or was it something that was inherently you? I think that friendship equipped me um, I've got I've, I've had like weekly walks with friends over years where we've really listened deeply to each other so that you know I don't know about male friendship because I'm, I'm not in it but um, I find with my female friends in particular and some of my male friends we're we're right there you know we're right there and and when we're not judging that lovely Carl Rogers thing of you know we're not um, we're, we're holding in a positive regard non-judgmental mm. positive regard and I think over the years, my friendships have really equipped me for that, yeah. So those, those walks with, with friends and, and that sort of deep listening and, and holding the space mm -hmm. for each other, is, it feels like that was a training before training, mm. almost like a, a, a practice that enabled you to be able to hold so much information. Mm. Mm. So I think actually when I was really young, I used to love just um, sitting in nature as well. So the friendship, definitely that sort of listening to other, but then listening to yourself and be being a container for your own stuff so that you can be a container for someone else's. That's, that's a big part of it too, isn't it? Yeah. In yeah. coaching. I, so it, it sort of made, I, I feel my brain jumping yeah, all yeah, over yeah. the place because it makes me think of that, that thought that, you know, we, we have to be working on ourselves as coaches. Yeah. You know, there is a, uh, this idea that we're working with others and we're yeah. supporting others, but without that yeah. self 
work. Yeah. We don't have the energy, we don't have the, the vibrancy, the, yeah. the, the fuel to, 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 share to share and to yeah, hold that to space. Hold that, exactly. And I guess depending on what your life experiences have been, some people are going to um, be a, just a fairly simple you know, person. They haven't necessarily had you know, much material to have to work through. And I guess that, that may mean they, don't, they can't necessarily empathise with some of the material that someone might bring in. Um, I mean, at a young age, I loved being in nature. I grew up in Australia, I was in the, you know, just sitting there, you know, making daisy chains is a wonderful memory. And my nickname, Wizzy Daisy. I couldn't <laughs> say my name when I was little, Libby Davy, so Wizzy Daisy. <laughs> and that kind of, you know, just being present to me in the world, I guess, just being in nature a lot. And then um, I got more and more involved in meditation. Um, and that was great. I mean, one year I went on retreat you know, six times. I used to, to cook in order to afford to, you know, to be on retreat and my little girl was old enough and my husband would support me. Um, but the other thing is I have actually had quite a lot of trauma. So I've done quite a lot of psychotherapy to help with that and also just learned to kind of hold myself. So menopause has actually been a really, really positive experience for me, quite difficult. But in preparing the ground for my daughter to enter adolescence, I had to be with a lot of old material that just started coming up with sleepless nights, with hot flushes and things. And I had to kind of be present to my own stuff a lot more, well, in, in a quite a strong way and, and always throughout. So the clearing of that activated by menopause and also coming into the coaching world um, meant that I, I have just released a huge amount and integrated a huge amount and I can be very present to myself and maybe therefore to others because of that because I'm not sitting there all worried about my stuff. Mm. My, my stuff's mm. good. I've kind of, it's energetically shifted and lifted and left my body mostly. So, I mean, it's ongoing, but so I, I, I find it quite easy in a way beautiful, like meditative, to be there with my client. Well, it was something that uh, uh, Hetty said in the talk that she did with Animus, where she talked about being in flow. Yeah. And I think there is something there when we've worked on ourselves, even if the work isn't complete, well, when is it complete? But that notion that we're doing the work yeah. and we're working with our yeah. clients, yeah. That, that I find flow kind of comes into the yeah. space. Yeah, yeah. So, so my daughter's called B, Beatrice. And, and if I was going to have another daughter, um, I was going to call her Flo. <laughs> Be in Flo, yeah. Lovely. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, Flo is a... And Mahali Chiksen Mahali writes, you know, about it. It's one of the most often quoted, you know, mm. pieces um, in, in, in the area of psychology and human development because, yeah, Flo is that optimal state of being... Yeah. Present, and that's how coaching feels to me, really, which is why I love it. If I'm not getting my six sessions a week, you know, I, I start to get a bit, you know, like, <laughs> I need some more coaching. And that's, that's the primary motivator, in a sense, is I want to be of service and in flow. Lovely. Yeah. And you, uh, you spoke a bit about sort of the other organisations that you work yeah. with. So is that through a, a coaching lens or is that a, a, a different lens? Yeah, so I mean, if someone, if I coach with someone, they may then be my sponsor to enter the organization. Um, it depends really, there's, there's lots of different ways in. I've just finished a piece of work with the founder of a really amazing um, organization called Wild Philanthropy. And he brought in, you know, an, a, a new guy to possibly become, you know, the leader of that organization. And so I coach the two of them separately and then together, as well as, you know, looking strategically at what their business was to help them come into alignment with each other. Now, actually, they were in a really, really good place. It wasn't, it wasn't a, a, going to be a complex piece of work, but there was a lot of complexity in it. Um, so with the background in stakeholder engagement, and also I have a couple of startups under my belt, um, I, I can work with, you know, I, I mean, I've worked just in, across most sectors, m most sorts of organisations. Something like values and vision work, I really, really love. Culture, I really, really love. Um, but what I've realised is that if you're going into an organisation, if it's one-to-one -one coaching, that's fine. Like Women for Women International had a beautiful gig with an amazing young woman who was really rising up into philanthropy. Um, and it was quite a clean, simple piece of work in a way. But if I wanted to work more systemically throughout the organisation, I think it's important to have other associates 
to sense check and build the team to work together because the institutions are quite solidified in what mm. their behaviours are. And I think it just makes sense to have at least two people in the team. It's, that's really interesting. It reminds me of when I used to work with uh, creative partnerships. Yeah. And we used to... Back in the day. Back in the day. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and we used to go into to schools and we'd be working Beautiful and there was a sense of... Oh. You couldn't spend too long there as an individual because you then became the institution. So you had to keep stepping out, yeah. working with others, yeah. and then coming back in. Yeah. Uh, if you just stayed in a school running your project, mm -hmm. after a while you fell into the patterns mm -hmm. because they were so solid around you as yeah, well. Exactly, yeah. So I think one of the things that we bring is we're coming from outside to give... Um, what um, Adam Grant's an amazing guy who writes, um, was it Outsiders, I think his book was, one of them. And it's like, you've got the status quo, and, and if it was perfectly fine, then leave it to do its thing. But usually we're coming in as some form of intervention to help mm. it evolve. And, um, you know, you have that status quo. So Adam Grant was talking about, th I guess, cognitive... Um, diversity, you know, so bringing in something which is not the same as that. Um, but what's difficult is that if you speak truth to those power systems, they may not like to hear it because the status quo is very entrenched. So you get things like scapegoating and whistleblowing and shoot the messenger, which I've been involved in in many different institutions, which I find fascinating if you don't take it personally. But when you look at something as serious as climate change, you know, I believe that what we need is kind of like radical self-leadership um, as well as um, more servant leaders in organisations to really step up and look at what's going on, look at social justice um, uh, and look at you know, what's happening with the environment because otherwise people end up quite, organisations end up quite moribund they end up anxious, they mm. end up depressed because it's not natural and healthy for human beings to degrade themselves and the world. And the longer we do it, the more it's a kind of a sickness. So if we don't have people like coaches and consultants, and, I, and I'm not sure whether I mean the McKinsey kind because they're quite large, but people that can come in and give interventions and yeah. help, I would call it cultural chiropractic, Okay. kind of help, you know, make adjustments and open things up to really look at what are our values, how are we living them individually and collectively. So I suppose there's a thought here around how um, being so passionate as you are about, uh, about that sort of chiropractory of the, of the mm. systems, mm. Um, how the systems might be a little resistant well, to indeed, that. absolutely, yeah. So I guess, you know, you need to be very resilient and you need to have your kindreds around you um, to help you do that kind of work. And, and personally, I've, I mean, I've had death threats, you know, for projects I've worked on. Hedy has some theories about, you know, what, you know the more you, you bring in the light, the more the, the dark can, can emerge. So it's, it can be really, really scary, particularly as a woman, to, to take these positions. But... It's not really about me. I'm not here, you know, it's not necessarily my agenda. I, I think it's just what needs to emerge. Mm -hmm. and, and I just try not to take it too personally. But I do know women who are rising into positions of power and men, you know, that get into trouble, you know, um, by speaking, you know, the truth. But then again, it's not about, there, there might be absolutes that we need to look at, but in a coaching sense, it's not about my truth. It's yeah. about, again, the client's truth that wants to emerge. Yeah, and the truth in that moment as well, because one of the exactly. beautiful things is a truth now can shift into yeah. a different truth later. And exactly. that, that sort of, that fluidity yeah. of what's emerging, emerging and, and what's coming. Emerging, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I love the way Hedy talked about in her book, The Future of Coaching, that it's not like we need to kind of like fight the power. Um, it makes good sense to me, because I'm very practical at the end of the day, um, that the, the patriarchy, if you like, or the dominant hegemony, the system mm -hmm. that's kind of degrading the planet, as perhaps exemplified by, you know, Donald Trump and the worst excesses of humanity. Um, you know, it, it's not about fighting it. It's just going to get diluted because the good men are going to get better, better coaching. 
<laughs> and the good women, you know, and the millennials and the third ages, the wise elders that we need, they're not going to disappear. I'm not going to disappear. You're not going to disappear. We're going to stay in there. I, I, yeah? I love that notion. We're going to dilute. Yeah, so that the more of us structures. there are, Absolutely. the more change we can bring yeah. about. And those poor wounded people, women and men, that think that propping up their systems, you know, just to get rich is okay. It's not even making them happy. Some of the philanthropists I've met lately, you know, they go to Africa where they've got projects and they sing and they dance and they're happy. Yeah. Much happier than living yeah. in those massive, you know, houses on well, their own. I mean, there's that whole piece with coaching of, you know, exploring what is it that makes you happy? What, what is it that you are looking for? Yeah. Uh, and, and how are those, uh, the, the objects or the external isn't necessarily it and how can we find that and you know yeah, looking inside yeah, to yeah. to see what that's yeah, about exactly which coaching can be extremely you know yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah yeah now i'm aware that we could go on for hours yeah. so uh, we're definitely going to have to have you back so we yeah. can continue these conversations but yeah. before we go i'd love to just hear sort of what what's next yeah so I, i've been in quite a massive growth phase where i've said yes to a lot of opportunities and now i need to kind of like hone it back um I'm getting more involved with a wonderful organization called the United World Colleges, who recruit young people who are passionate about peace, internationalism, and sustainability. And they are very prestigious schools, very hard to get into, but they have refugees to royalty. So I'm looking at, I'm working with their alumni okay. who are rising into positions of, of power um, in various spaces. And just simplifying life, I'm, I'm doing some peer-to-peer -peer work for coaches I love coaching coaches because of the potency of what we do, really. Um, there's, there's a lot on the cards. There's a book in the <laughs> pipeline um, at the moment, working title, Leaders That Love, funnily enough. Um, but I think the most important thing is just to keep living as spaciously as possible and stay grounded, yeah, so that I can, you know, grow from there. So Libby, uh, where might somebody find you? Well, I have a website. It's called humanbells.com and there's an email list they can subscribe to to stay in touch with what's coming up. There's also a Facebook group for Human Bells that they can join. It's, it's been an absolute a pleasure speaking with you today, Libby, and I look forward to our next conversation. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you.